Hey, Tovarishi. As you may know, me, Hakim, and JT from Second Thought have started a podcast called The D Program, a truly international weekly semi edgy politics, news, and philosophy show spanning pretty much the whole world, from the Balkans to Iraq and the United States. Find it on your preferred audio platforms through one of the links in the description. I'll never forget how confused I was for the first time when I met a boy, no, a man who was jealous of his own father. His dad had bought a new car, and he was left with an old one. His dad, his blood, the very man who gave him life, was no longer just a parent, seen through that prism, but a business associate, a bank, a financial partner, and even competitor. The family commodified. Engels, who doubled both as Marx's literally and philosophical partner, as well as the sugar daddy to beat all other sugar daddies, published a very important and relatively controversial to this day piece of literature not long after Marx had passed. Based on his own thoughts and research, those of Marx and of a Lewis Henry Morgan, a 19th century anthropologist and advocate for Native American rights, he published The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. In it, he discusses the development of human society and the family, while his views on the different stages of social growth, from what he calls primitive communism to today's capitalism, are incredibly interesting, though a bit debunked by the anthropological community, his views on capitalism's impact on the so-called bourgeois family is absolutely fascinating. People whose whole career is based in conspiratorial fear-mongering have been misquoting the Marxian stance on family since the good old Cold War, pitching the idea that somehow they want to derail everything and anything you hold dear, nationalizing children, throwing them in the town square to be raised by the commune, or telling parents how to look after their kids and other such nonsense. All this couldn't be further from the truth. Engels' book, if anything, implies that the very modern ideals of familiar connection based on love, community, and care have been corrupted by one simple thing. The financial relationship and dependence these family members share. Now, what does that exactly mean? Well, let's take a deep dive. To simplify greatly, and I do mean greatly, according to Engels, there were three stages to the development of the family. The first stage was when we established a difference between generations and allowed only the formation of families between those in similar ones, a period where relationships between parents and children no longer occurred, a stage which differentiated us from animals. The second stage extended the taboo to relationships between siblings as well, but due to a lack of knowledge at the time, relationships between first cousins most likely still occurred. In the final stage, which occurred eons ago for the first time, the husband had one primary wife. Inbreeding was practically eradicated, and monogamy as a concept slowly arose into the mainstream. It is in this third stage, the monogamous relationship between two people, that we see the economic impact wealth and property begin having on our actions and values. For example, it's sound to believe that polygamy was still common amongst men, but no longer amongst women since their fidelity was what ensured the child's legitimacy. Ownership was still passed down from generation to generation, but from sibling to sibling. It's only in the establishment of primitive feudal and later bourgeois societies that we saw the concept of inheritance, as we know it today, to having developed. Hoarding wealth, land, serfdoms, and power made little sense if there was nobody to give it to upon your passing. When the accumulation of capital, wealth you can use to make more wealth, and private property, land and buildings used to actively generate money, began to play a key role in everyone's hierarchical position in the world, it slowly but surely seeped its way into the family structure. Engels' argument is as follows. 
Two partners will always have the preservation of inheritance in mind and as such will never be truly and in its entirety free to choose their partners. The only couple that can wholeheartedly believe their relationship is founded on true compatibility and that their love for one another and their children is unobstructed by anything except the relationships themselves are the proletariat because the working class owns little and can offer nothing except knowledge and wisdom to their partner and kids, their love is uncorrupted by the inherently prostitution-like nature of the capital-oriented family. To explain a bit more simply, so-called capitalist families which own larger businesses, rent extracting land, condos and apartments put out for rent, or who are very large stock owners and corporate board members, have linked themselves to massive money-making industries, and as such cannot be truly seen as separate individuals when looking to start a family. The relationship is no longer between two people, but one between two people and their capital. Mike, who owns a Fortune 500 company, can no longer just be Mike. He's Fortune 500 Mike. And his marriage and relations to his children will forever reflect that. The proletariat is not left unscathed by this either, as it's coerced into attempting to marry into the bourgeois class in order to better its ever-diminishing status in society. As instruments for financial independence grow ever rarer, with lower paying jobs, higher unemployment, and a stagnant average wage in the face of eternal inflation, the family becomes commodified, corrupted into being yet another instrument of wealth creation. But hey, that right there might seem like some kind of an emotional argument, saying that by turning ourselves into capitalists, we are transforming into something other than ourselves, and that therefore we'll never know if someone loves us for us or for our position in capitalist hierarchy. But what about people who don't care about those material things, you might ask? They certainly still exist, right? Well, yes and uh, no. I mean, if we look at children inside of the capitalist framework who literally represent the definition of a group that shouldn't care about your money, your literal offspring, we see that even their relationship to their parents has also, in extension, become a relationship with their parents' money. They turn from genetic offspring into potential future execs and current middle managers of their family's wealth. Engels and Marx see the family as a microcosm of the larger state. Within the family, he is the bourgeois, and the wife represents the proletariat. The husband who enjoys the fruit of this labor functions as the bourgeois because, though the wife is paid in room and board, the value he extracts from his wife far exceeds the cost of her upkeep. Some of you are probably familiar with the left's viewpoint towards this historical dichotomy in cis-straight relationships. It doesn't only apply to the housewife either. Modern capitalism, by not only introducing but forcing both partners into the workforce, has done two things. Double the amount of work required by the woman, who now has to toil away for a boss at work, and her husband at home, as well as almost completely annihilating the choice before any woman or man for that matter to dedicate their life to caring for the family due to most people's financial inability to do so. Basically, the economic model has only supplied both members of a monogamous relationship with more work and less time for their own family. Sure, it has rejected traditional patriarchal values to an extent, in hopes of boosting the labor pool with female workers. But it's only introduced women to obedience at work instead of obedience at home. But all that's very well discussed, especially by far more brilliant feminist scholars than myself. I'll let them tell their stories. What's talked about far less in the left, but is extremely misconstrued by the right, is capitalism's influence on the relationships we have with our kids or parents, respectively. 
I find it very unfortunate that the conversation about family and so-called family values has been kidnapped by conservative demagogues who mostly use it to sell homophobic and heavily patriarchal values. In a way, it's almost beautifully ironic. The very system those same neocon idiots are trying to sell you on as being a natural extension of the family is the one putting the most stress on it. In the olden days, very large families often stuck together for life or until marriage. The need for able-bodied farmers to reap the land and supply food for themselves and their children kept everyone in the same household for quite a while. Grandparents got to actually see their grandkids, and adults could take care of their aging parents. The family unit was brought together due to the needs put on them by that system. As we've evolved into the modern capitalist framework, that has all but disappeared. It's not better or worse, it's just different. But what is undeniable is the economic model's impact on the family structure. Why is it so stressed that a kid should leave their parents' home at 18, either to receive gainful employment or pursue a university degree? Again, a few systematic reasons. The financial stress on the parents is to be alleviated as their careers have either peaked or are slowly descending in the local area's labor pool. The kids themselves are needed by that same labor pool as well, and are therefore encouraged to finally turn off the child in them and become not only an adult, but an adult worker. The religion of competition blows its whistle and pits millions of young adults against each other in the race to make their parents the proudest ones in the neighborhood. The longevity of family life is quite literally cut short, all based around a fictional age cap because the economy needs fresh blood. Any family which chooses to not pursue that model is ostracized, where both the parents are seen as meek and the kids as lazy. But that's just one small random example. How many kids we have, on average, goes down the wealthier a country, with a few exceptions. This is often attributed to availability of birth control methods, a higher level of average education, and more opportunities being available to citizens. All factors which do considerably impact if the average family has one or two kids versus, I don't know, seven. But that's not all. Every child costs time and work, family labor, but also very real capital. And today, it costs more than it ever did in history. The opportunities our potential children can have are directly linked to how much we can invest in them. Education being the simplest of examples, tutors, private schools, and highly known and respected universities, or capital to start a firm, will skyrocket a child's chances of future economic success. Therefore, unless unfathomably wealthy, the family which wanted to grow shrinks massively in size due to the simple realization that we can sometimes only afford one child or two, not that we don't want more, but that the possibility for giving our all for a child financially diminishes with every next child born. Responsible parents are forced into thinking and calculating and analyzing their children as business ventures. The whole relationship adults and kids have with their parents is built around the collected wealth and capital the household possesses. It's either softened up thanks to the wealth sharing or heavily strained on because of the lack of it. Kids, who aren't even workers or capitalists, become an extension of whichever of the two their parents happen to be. Every high school has the rich kids, the middle, and a bunch of the downtrodden. Their first interaction with hierarchy of the adult world starts for them as an extension of the financial grouping their parents are in. And while for the modest child, their love and respect for their parent will mostly depend on the genuine interpersonal relationships they have, for a family with any sort of wealth, the child is no longer just a member of the family, but a boss in training, working their parents towards the goal of one day inheriting all that wealth and responsibility. 
The financialization of everything has completely taken over the very definition we have of what it means to be a good parent or child. We're proud of our children if they depict ruthlessness and cunning we know is necessary for survival in today's world. We judge them based on their ability to keep carrying the capital we've accumulated past our own lives. In a weird, messed up way, we sometimes even grow jealous of our parents or our children. Your ability to take care of your old folks, if your relationship wasn't completely destroyed by the time they're pensioners, is completely based around your monetary capability to put them in a nice home, send them to nice vacations, or give them high-end medical coverage. Furthermore, how good of a parent you are almost completely revolves around your capabilities as a breadwinner, completely ignoring the equally if not more important aspects of parenthood, time spent, love given, and wisdom passed on. Time spent with the family has also been crushed. On one side of the aisle, we're bombarded by work, work we take on gladly to bring about a better life for our families, but work that in the long run does not much more but alienate us from the very same family we're trying to take care of. Or, in contrast, it puts a burden, especially on childbearing people, that they are somehow forced to choose between a career and the joy of birth. On one hand, we are lazy if we spend time with our families, and are lazy if we don't. The market's constant privatization of child group care, be it schools or daycare, doesn't help with this in the slightest either. And what about careers? Yes, the thing you either spent half of your teenage years arguing with your parents about or in contrast agreed with them fully on. How many families completely lose out on the arguably most important reason they exist in the first place? Support. Because they're scared that the career choice their kid is making might not be in line with climbing the monetary ladder. How many parents dissuade and in a way manipulate their very offspring into pursuing something they absolutely hate because it might bring stability? How many push their very own child into the same career path they chose or into the same business they built because someone has to continue the work? The child is the boss in training, nothing more, nothing less. And honestly, who can blame a parent for thinking they're doing what's best for their children? I repeat this all the time and I'll do it again. Societal problems are systematic and not individual. We are consequences of our environment. So Judy the painter, don't blame your book smart mama for wanting you to be a dentist. And Jeremy the dentist, don't blame your hippie daddy for pushing you to paint. Their parenting is an extension of their life experience that's arguably never going to go away. Where the problem lies with the capitalist family experience, though, is that it's not just our parents trying to make kids like them. It's that parents who knowingly gave up on their dreams in pursuit of financial stability and economic growth are so corrupted by the very system that they think passing the torch of petty wage slavery to their own kids is the right thing to do. Stripped of hope for purpose, drenched in alienation, the modern parent is stimulated on all sides not to save their own kid from the very prison they enshackle themselves in, but quite in contrast, to tell them there's no prison at all. When Marx and Engels talk about abolishing the family, they're simply noting that the process has already begun, quite a while ago, in capitalism. Every non-financialized structure, be it family, relationships, hobbies, passions, are systematically commodified to stimulate a transactional relationship. While there is no standardized definition of a family we can follow without alienating at least one section of society, it would be immaterial to not note that this ever so important concept, at least to me and I hope to many others, changes and adapts to every mode of social organization it exists in. It's molded by the social and economic conditions that the family is forced to live under. Depending on the class relations in a given era or a given place, the family is repackaged in order to best serve the system, as capitalism itself gets closer to the brink of collapse with every re-emerging crisis, the question we must ask ourselves is what sort of families we want to build in the future. 
Do we embrace the market and simply run our households as businesses, concentrated on wealth hoarding while competing against other families? Do we backpedal into older traditionalist models of what constitutes a family, hoping that we will somehow make ourselves feel something again? Or maybe, and hear me out here, we allow ourselves to build families most suitable for us and our loved ones on the basis of respect, comradeship, and love for love's sake, where romantic relationships aren't underpinned by one's dominion of the other, where parental pride isn't only born out of seeing greed grow in your child's eyes, where families are liberated from comparison and competition, and they're given the chance to grow into their own unique definitions of what a family even is. Thank you for watching. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane. I haven't even released 30 videos. Click that subscribe button and let's hit that completely arbitrary, meaningless number soon so I can tap myself on the back. Furthermore, if you like my videos, do consider supporting me on Patreon. For the price of less than a can of beer a month, you'd be helping me support myself as well as keeping my videos 100% sponsor free and therefore truly independent. Plus, it's not like any of these videos get advertiser approval anyway. Thank you in advance for even considering it. Now, I would like to take the time to thank all the wonderful Tavarishi without whom this channel wouldn't even be able to run. Especially... Deep Red Wine, Soup, Nathan Moore, B Matt, Floshi Spin, Nibino, B Young, Cap, Red Messiah, Fredjden Jarrett, Grim Water, Hiram, 17, Lilia, Kaylees, Maitake Kun, Tanker Kiss Possidist, Ian Snyder, Probably Fang, 3N B1, Script, Dead Spartan 08, Display Name, Red American, Jesus Salcero, Eric Gersowitz, ML1822, Daniel Sachs, Snow Raven, Mukicha, Noel Hemdal, James Burkhardt, Mike Gulyash, Sean, Autumn Takasha Dong, Nikola Radovanovic, Stuart Frank, Thomas Rawson Wood, Harda Sullivan, Zane Guevara, The Muffin Man, Mike, Boyan, Michael Mahoney, Fellow Worker, Alki Historiker, User, Clement Feiss, Neil Surio, Sam and Eggs, Cruton and Baguette, Evie Wren.